Publishing has been undergoing massive structural changes in the last two decades, particularly in areas such as digital publishing and archiving. Influenced by corporatized behaviors on the parts of books, book and tech industry, the free market determines in many ways how knowledge is made accessible. Independent bottom-up practices are an important contrapoint to this tendency. They reflect on capitalist structures, seeking alternatives to resist while simultaneously creating a common culture. This paper sparks from the current shifting times in cultural institutions, exploring the idea of the undercommons based on Stefan Harney and Fred Morton's writings. I will show today some acts of resistance proposed by shadow libraries and amateur librarians around the world. Traversed by the undercommons as a double agent model, engaging both the institution and the underground, this presentation is structured around the concept of opacity and legitimation. Using art and art institutions to make that possible. I will give an overview on how the work from the shadows leaks back into institutional structures and might be validated by them. Being in the shadows implies specific kinds of invisibility, which allows things to happen that might not be possible in plain view. Shadow libraries intersect between the commons and the underground to jointly qualify a subversive, travel-making type of resistance and a collective fugitive organization beyond privatization of knowledge. All the projects presented here take different approaches to visibility and the potential risks coming from their practices. Many shadow libraries have been working in partial view and use art practices and institutions to create particular types of protection. As a form of complicity, art and education agents offer legitimation to a practice that is established in the limits of legality. For this reason, being concerned with how, why, and where publications are made accessible is essential to their interpretation. Books, magazines, and articles require the engagement of people to support their circulation. The core of my research is to understand the responsibilities assumed by shadow practitioners, pirates, in creating their cultural history, protecting and sharing all knowledge that they think it's worth defending, and the impact this practice has in the ecology of institutions. Okay, Harney and Morton in their essay about the undercommons explain that their purpose consists of not being against the institutions to disarticulate the for or against logic in institutional critique. They propose a double agent model engaging both the institution and crime. Quote, the only possible relation to the university today is a criminal one, to abuse its hospitality, to spy its mission, to join its refugee colony. Using the university as an example for other institutions of governance, the authors explain that in the underground, it is where the work is done, subverted and obscure. They urge us to steal from the institutions and relocate what's stolen in fugitive spaces of black study. When the commons are not always accessible, the undercommons present modes to be involved in common amateur practices. Professionalism organizes itself in antagonism to the wild, the unregulated and the ignorant, without acknowledging their labor. While there is no purpose in excluding professionalization from the institutions, institutions do not recognize and even ignore the amateur. In this way, amateurism offers the openness to be affected by others without the limits imposed by institutions, markets, and states. Being outside governance makes the model unintentionally illegible. A growing number of shadow libraries challenging the library expert authority have come to support co-authorship, expand the, really the responsibility for the process of deciding what is missing and needs to be included, and how this knowledge is categorized and shared. The criminality of the undercommons is opposed to professionalization and their situations of increasing precarization. Amateur librarians organize themselves 
from within those conditions, allowing subjectivity and personal drive. The impulse to steal from the institutions is done with neither apology nor malice. The practice is not, not naive either, but as the urgency to share originates, it becomes imperative not only to counter the influence of a hegemonic discourse, but also to occupy a space collectively. Libraries emerge to democratize the access to books, offering media under terms publishers and handlers cannot or wouldn't do it. One of the library's purposes is to balance the book business, but in many cases the challenge of providing affordable access to materials is left to students, faculty, artists and curious people to figure out for themselves. Despite adverse conditions, people get the materials they need through informal networks that emerge in many contexts to distribute materials. From external, external hard drives, shared person to person, and private folders in Google Drive, to online data lockers such as ARG, or peer-to-peer -peer distributed repositories such as Memory of the World Public Library. On account of digital copies, the publication is no longer a limited supply. With only a few resources, everyone could be in the position to provide low-cost access to knowledge, while shadow libraries and are, under, oh, sorry, <coughs> are under the line of legality and their content is far from being universal. The users create collections without bureaucratic and economic limitations. Amateur shadow librarians store, organize, and circulate digital media for themselves and their colleagues. So I have I structured this presentation with three case studies. Um, first of all, I will like both of, two of the examples are from people here, and they will present later. So um, a library collects, indexes, presents, and presents information while taking into account archival, economic, and knowledge construction perspectives. A shadow library works in the same way, but its purpose is unofficial. The infrastructure and content of shadow libraries is thought, built, and operated by private initiatives, small groups of people, or individuals who often remain anonymous due to the unauthorized character of their practice. They assume the distributed task of organizing pieces of knowledge, preserving and enlarging collections according to their needs, regardless of their legality. Shadow libraries engage without destroying the institutions in the name of progress or revolution. They offer greater accessibility to what's inside the institution, bringing it more organically outside within the public sphere. ARC was born as ARC.org more than 10 years ago by the artist Sean Dockery and is currently hosted by Marcel as ARC.fail. Comparable to a local book club or discussion group, in ARC people share publications, thoughts and observations over time, the focus of the project shifted from a small group of people sharing <coughs> sorry. sharing ideas about a few books to thousands of members uploading and downloading material from its server without charge. The users of the site tend to be writers, artists, activists, designers, philosophers, and members of academia. Since the beginning, ARG supported self-organized reading groups and spawned a second project called The Public School, which supports autodidactic activities with the aim to create alternative possible futures for art education. Dockery defines ARG as a generative scaffolding between institutions. Quote, the image of scaffolding was simply a way of describing an orientation with respect to institutions that was neither inside nor outside, dependent nor independent, reformist or oppositional, etc. At the time, the institutions I meant were specifically universities, which seemed, which seemed to have absorbed theory into closed seminar rooms, academic formalities and rarefied publishing, publishing worlds. Circulating digitalized copies as of the outside the paths, paths governed by local distribution, price, and contracts, ARG became a meeting space for people who wanted to share knowledge. Users ask each other for digital copies of particular texts, and when those files are, are, are uploaded, 
they stay available on the site for the users. But the risk of this practice is not small. Many shadow libraries try to distribute their material, making use of selective visibility. Being small and out of reach is a strategy that most shadow libraries use for their protection. Other projects, such art, when they become visible, have an approach more similar to loopholing. Many copyright laws have exemptions of use, uh, of, fair, of exemptions or fair use regulations. They vary accord, according to national le legislation and allow for the use of copyrighted works under specific provisions without permission. At public appearances and presentations, DOCRI emphasizes the educational character of the project and its non-commercial orientation. Such, ca such categorization um, is intended to shift the attention away from the notion of illegality and toward questions of public interest and the common good. Another camouflage tool used around the platform is to frame it as an artistic project. Artworks and art institutions that allow a certain kind of legibility and visibility, meanwhile the enforcement of copyright laws within the arts have other legislations in relation to quotation, citation and remix. However, some publishing houses did object to the site. In 2009, the publisher Verso Books asked ARG to remove all its publications per the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. However, the consequences were not long-lasting. People re-uploaded the books as many of the users download the content of the platform regularly. In 2010, ARG was taken down by the publisher Macmillan over a specific text, including Beyond Capital. But the amateur librarians are resilient. They uploaded the, the whole content of the website under a similar name in other server a few times later. This is the reason why our name has changed over time. Usually adding A's as the site keep, had to keep moving to protect its identity. The platform moves in the way in digital data moves, being copied between directories and changing its name and location. The second project of this presentation is uh, Memory of the World, Public Library, initiated by Tomislav and Marcel. Um, the project empowers people to digitalize, collect and share, share and preserve publications that are unaffordable, unavailable or undesirable. The online platform and its articulation in the form of artwork and art exhibitions provide sites of resistance to traditional notions of value and use libraries conventions as mechanisms of rebellion, resilience and play. The collection of memory of the world is created mostly by individuals and communities who decide to digitalize books by themselves for their personal use, while each person is only able to scan and index a few publications. The small contributions increase the collection. Memory of the World Public Library survives on the voluntary work of individuals. The value of peer generated collection contrasts with the investment that will be required to create an equivalent archive, archive within an institution. By giving the opportunity to organize a repository with others, this project encourages to think about the library as a free space that presents unrestricted access to knowledge, participated participating in a more significant action to oppose the commodification of education and the introduction of artificial scarcity. The political aspects of the project and the efforts to form and publicize the movement were expressed more expi explicitly as part of group exhibitions at the National Museum Centro de Arte Reina Sofia in Madrid in 2014 and in 2015 at Gallery Nova in Zagreb, during one solo and one group exhibition, all created by the Croatian collective Behave. Public Library uses art as the foundation to release publications from copyright restrictions while raising legitimation from the art world as cultural capital that could protect them against possible copyright charges. The presentation the presentation and realization of the project within allied institutions obscure the question of legality. The shelter offered by institutions draws on the autonomy of art, which supposedly gives art its own laws to, be, to not be controlled by external forces. Bejave and Public Library test the power of that claim, installing art as a field of unlimited freedom, 
as Vejavi explains in their article, there is something political in the city area from 2016. This account will imply that through said autonomy, art can acquire the power to act in other realms, even as the character of art is continuously up for question. In case of a possible lawsuit, um, the claims of autonomy give a platform and a shelter as all parties become complicit in the operation. Institutions embracing and even co-opting critical discourse provide in this case an opportunity. Memory of the World Public Library uses the public status of the art institution to communicate free access and circulation of knowledge as common sense, while the institution brings knowledge to the public and supports creativity. The same method that grant market regulations could also be applied to exert political government, making copyright a tool for censorship and surveillance. Making information free online, it is an extremely use, useful practice. However, tactics are changing towards the issues around privacy and control. The resistance extend, extends from freeing information to liberating information about information. Some of the additional data created when editing a file and the identities of the people who upload and post online are private to other people, but much of it is owned by tech companies and might be tracked and shared with businesses and governments. With the new vulnerabilities of the online, the return to offline digital distribution has gained a momentum. Although restoring an earlier form of exchange, contemporary devices provide more agile equipment to circulate larger quantities of data in less time. Methods for offline sharing are often used for artistic projects. One of these projects is Dead Drops, a project conceived by Berlin-based conceptual artist Aran Bartol, Bartol installed the first USB mass storage device in a public space in October 2010 in Brooklyn. The USB flash drives are typically mounted on outer brick walls and securing the structure with concrete. People are implicitly invited to find or leave files by plugging their laptops or mobile devices into the wall mounted, mounted USB sticks in order to transfer data. Dead drops could be regarded as a form of anonymous offline file sharing network, and on top of that, the project is documented online on a website under the same name, providing instructions to build our own devices. Although Bartol's proposition is quite relevant for the circulation of shadow libraries in general, especially as the artists share the project as an open source work, when found in countries from the global south, these practices become more than creative gestures. Cuba has one of the highest standards of literacy in the world, but at the same time, one of the lowest rates of internet access. Most Cubans reach the internet through public Wi-Fi parks, which are expensive, inconsistent, and inconvenient, and the bandwidth is restricted and some content might be unavailable. As a result, Cubans have developed an offline system for distributing digital content called El Paquete Semanal, which is translated as the weekly package. El Paquete is a digital library distributed unofficially through USB sticks and portable hard drives since approximately 2008. The diverse collection includes movies and TV shows, music, digitalized magazines and books, and complete copies of websites, including Wikipedia. The distribution of El Paquete has been allowed by a lack of government disruptions. The Cuban state tolerates El Paquete as long as the top distributors continue to self-censor overtly political content. While Cuban communication is still profoundly shaped by the state and its official media, El Paquete reveals how decentralized networks is virtually impossible to control. Almost everyone in Cuba has a source for receiving El Paquete, whether it's a store or a friend who gives them a copy free of charge. Once data is obtained from a distributor, it can then be shared with others through hand-to-hand -hand transmission on USB storage or over Bluetooth between mobile devices. The content that makes El Paquete is secret secretly downloaded at university computers, 
government workplaces or luxury hotels. Brought into the country on physical hard drives by friends or relatives from abroad or captured from illegal satellite dishes. Beyond foreign material, there is a significant amount of content produced specifically for El Paquete. Some examples include Vistar, an independent magazine devoted to Cuban culture, and Sección Arte, a collection of Cuban art sources initiated by artist Nestor Cire and updated weekly by the artists in the island. A single week's Sección Arte might contain several digital artworks, ebooks, and PDFs of artistic books and references, audio lectures, video works, images of exhibitions around the world, and saved HTML documents, taking full advantage of the digital affordances of the distribution system. Each collection travels Cuba through a network of hard drives moved by car, plane, train, and bus. Several mid-level distributors and users may modify the content, editing, removing, or adding material. This distribution network is rooted in all physical channels established to disseminate international publications in the 70s, after the revolution. Offline circulation provides for one, one type of anonymity. It offers more visibility to taking part in the underground circulation system, while less surveillance from the government or corporations. Preventing monopolies, this highly decentralized and personal form of distribution ensures enormous penetration throughout the country. Its fluid form turns El Paquete into a complex arrangement full of interdependencies of infrastructural, technological, and social elements. To conclude, these case studies demonstrate that the phenomenon of shadow libraries cannot be reduced only to its copyright infringement, infringing aspects. On the contrary, it needs to be contextualized within a more extensive socio-political debate that positions the requests for free and unrestricted, unrestricted access to knowledge within efforts against the logic of capital, which currently aims to commodify all, all aspects of life. Active or passive collaborations with institutions make possible the redirect of funding and other resources into shadow libraries or other pirate projects. Precarious circumstances led to creative acts to defy regulations as an outlet for agency that challenges the system. Artists as users are particularly well equipped to exploit gray zones, never responding directly to expectations, nor refusing to engage, but rather working beyond governance. Art institutions, on the other hand, become tacit allies to amateur librarians where practices beyond legal could operate with the legitimation that museums and galleries could offer. Although their impact is different in the global north and the global south, self-education, shadow libraries, and amateur librarians emerge to contract spaces of privilege. Preserving knowledge under these conditions assumes new values which rise from social needs and self-organizing network structures. The lack of governance makes harder the legibility from the outside, and said opacity offers protection and the right to not be seen or decoded by an unwanted other. Shadow libraries are defended as a way to take back the autonomy of knowledge production and rebuild grants of solidarity, demanding new readings of its organizational frameworks and the collaboration between underground practices and institutions. Under this idea, the shadow library turns into a social space for communication and information, which houses a body of knowledge and experience that's organized by the community that's using it. The opportunity to participate is something institutions could learn, fr could learn from, users having a say in what is shared and how it's shared. Thank you. <laughs>